Good evening, everybody. Glad you could make it back again this Wednesday night with me. I'm really looking forward to our time together. I hope everybody's having a good week. Hey, Jim. <laughs> you are um, a faithful man. <laughs> I hope you guys are having a great night. And I hope everything's going well for you. I don't know. Um, where we live, things are getting um, kind of back to normal, except uh, going to restaurants and you can only sit in half of the places. They're X'd off and things like that. But hey, at least we're getting back in there somewhat. And um, just believing that this thing is going to pass rapidly. We've got friends across the country. Talked to some friends today in Arizona. And... Um, and they have friends and acquaintances that actually um, are battling the virus right now. So be mindful of that. Say a prayer for them. I know everybody's um, concerned with what's going on in our nation. And I tell you what I am too. It has become a matter of prayer. Our land needs to be healed. Our minds need to be healed. Our hearts need to be healed. This is a heart issue in our country. And um, I'm believing that um, the same God who gave his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our sins and pay the price of our sins is going to help us through these trials. And I'm praying that we finally put some things behind us and uh, just pray that if there's any ounce of anything inside of you that shouldn't be there, ask God to reveal it. Get it out. It does not need to be in you. It is doing you no good. Um, anything inside of you that does not line up with God's word. Hey, Sydney, my old high school buddy, number 87. <laughs> Sydney, I love you, man. Hey, Connie. God bless you, Connie. So glad you're tuned back in with me this week. And Tammy. Hope you and Fabian are doing well. Love you guys. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, before I get started, hey, if there's anything inside of us that shouldn't be there, only you really know what's inside of you. I mean, God knows. He really knows. But other than God, only you know. Only you know what's inside of you. And um, if there's anything that you're holding on to, any bitterness, any, um, any seed, of anything that, that would uh, fall into a category of hatred or, or deception or, or all those things, get that stuff out. God will deliver you from that. He'll get that out of you if he doesn't want it in you. And um, so I'm believing for um, deliverance and uh, that we're going to be able to move forward finally from some of these things that have been a plague in our nation for so many years. God help us. But I'm... Um, Tonight, I'm excited to be talking to you. I'm picking up about um, the spirit and the flesh and the battle that's always there. It's always there. Uh, the Bible tells us it's always there. We get in trouble thinking that, um, that, it's, that it's something that we can handle, but it's not. Okay, I hear you. All right, take a minute to like and share this post so that others can join us tonight. We do that for me. I know we've got several that, that can't tune in, and uh, I'm thankful for this avenue, for this opportunity of, of media. We can reach folks, but um, uh, if you've got friends that you could like and share this uh, so that they can join us tonight, that would be great. Other people um, are able to uh, catch it because, of course, it's recorded. Um, it's live now, but then it's recorded. You know how that stuff goes. I, I need to quit talking about that because I will show my ignorance <laughs> in the technological world. My wife will be laughing at me and making funny comments at me that I don't know if you can see or not. But anyway, I do see some comments tonight. And man, I'm so glad that you guys are with me and uh, very excited to get into this. So like it and share it if you will. And get some folks um, involved. Yes, amen. We're praying for our country. Our country needs it. Goodness knows. 
God knows how much we need. <laughs> Christine, you're hilarious. My wife, Christine. She said to stop while I am ahead. <laughs> She's talking about um, my prowess <laughs> on the technological field. But anyway, okay, I'm going to go ahead and announce it. By faith, my wife is going to come downstairs and join me next week. I invited her to tonight. She wasn't feeling it. I don't know if it was a makeup thing. I don't know what it was, but she wasn't feeling it. <laughs> and she's going to kill me for saying that. But anyway, she's going to help me out next week. Because sometimes it's just nice to talk to somebody in the room about these issues and to get some feedback. And, and um, really, a lot of this stuff that I'm preaching on Wednesday night is, is um, principles that helped me. That's what I was telling you last week. There's some principles that I learned that were taught to me uh, by some wonderful men and women of God that really opened my eyes to some things. And um, I want to share those things with you. Those things that helped me, I believe that they will help all of us. They'll help you. And uh, I want you to hear what, what those things are. Um, and I said this, I made this statement. The enemy knows who you are in Christ. It's very important that we get our established uh, our identity established in Christ. It, it is so important for you to know who you are in Christ. It's so important for you to know who you are in Christ because the, it, hear me now, it is so important for you to know who you are in Christ because the enemy knows who you are. He just thinks you don't know who you are in Christ. And sometimes our behavior may reflect that. We forget who we are. Anytime we uh, have emotional breakdowns of fear where we're overtaken by fear and, uh, and those type things, we're falling into the trap of the enemy to, number one, uh, forget about our identity in Christ. My identity in Christ, I'm, I'm going to wear my identity in Christ. It's who I am in Christ. It's who I am, and it, it is important for me to know it. If I don't know who I am in Christ, how can I expect anyone else to know who I'm in, in Christ? And the enemy will just pick me apart, uh, especially if I don't know my identity and who I am in Christ and what that means, being a citizen of heaven. So let me get right into this and um, and just say, this is this is one of the ways that, that the enemy um, will, will mess with you. The enemy knows who you are and he even knows your name, but he will call you by your sin. Think about that for a second. The enemy knows your name, but he will not address you by your name. He will address you by your sins. He will address you by your past sins. He will, he will try to dig up stuff from a long time ago and call you by that and, and label you as that. We're guilty of it ourselves. You know how we label people. Like in the Bible, you remember, we didn't know this woman's name. We just know that she is the woman with the issue of blood. We don't know this man's name. We just know that he was the lame man. We don't know this man's name. We just know that he was the blind man. If we're not very careful, we will label a person according to their issue or according to their struggle or according to some type of physical impairment that they have. And that's not fair. And the enemy does the same thing. He knows our name, but he calls us by our sin be it past sin, whatever. Here's the difference. Here's the good thing about God. God knows what our sin is, but he calls us by our name. <laughs> I love that. The enemy knows my name, but he'll call me by my sin. God knows my sin, but he'll call me by my name because it means something to him. It, it, it re is representation of our relationship with him that is so special. So last week I, I left off with this. Um, we were in Romans chapter eight, and I told you we might get to Ephesians chapter one. That is huge about our identity. I mean, Ephesians chapter one, just, just realize it uh, when you read it. It's what God says about you. 
<laughs> so you can take what other people say about you out of the equation. You can take what the enemy says about you out of the equation. Isn't that good news? So you don't have to hear his lies. You don't have to, to answer uh, when the enemy is calling you by a lie. I love what Martin Luther King says. He, he said this, and it, it, it impacted me. It, he said this, he said, it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. How about that? That's a good one, isn't it? I love that. What, what, what a revelation that man had. It's not what people call you, it's what you answer to. That right there helps you. It helps me out with my identity. It, may, it keeps me centered. It makes me not just answering any, anything that anybody says about me. Um, there are some things in my past and in your past and all of our past. I don't want to be labeled by that. You don't want to be labeled by that. I want to be labeled by this, what God says about me. I'm forgiven. <laughs> I'm not just forgiven. I'm chosen. I'm not just chosen. I'm adopted. And, I'm a, and, and the thing about being adopted shows a great deal about my choice. When someone's adopted, you see every flaw that they have. You, you see what their case history is, but you want them anyway. And you look past all of that because you want the desire of that relationship. You want to hold that little baby, that little child. You want them to have your name. You want them to, to claim you as theirs and you get to claim them as yours. That's what he does with us. And, and I'm going to live under that umbrella and I'm going to stay under that umbrella and I'm going to camp out under that tent and that's going to be my home where my identity is safe and it is secure in Christ. Amen. That's what he, a, a lot of what I love that is described in the New Testament is the statements that he makes about um, when it talks about us. It says, in him we have these promises. That's my identity in him. In him I live. In him I move. In him I have my being. In him, in him, in him. So that takes me out of it. Matter of fact, it's not got to do with anything that I've done. There's this, there's this religious spirit that, that um, it tries to trap us and makes us live up to a performance. This thing is, is not based on uh, performance. Well, actually it is, but it, thankfully it's not based on my performance. It's, bla it, it, it's based on his performance. <laughs> How about that? And his performance is perfect. You follow me around, hey, you're gonna be disappointed if I followed you around, hey, there'd reach a point where I'd be disappointed. Why? Because we're human. And I hope that most of the time I wouldn't be a, a, a disappointment, but there would be times, you could ask my wife, <laughs> you could ask my kids, unfortunately, there'd be times that I'd be a disappointment. But that's because I'm human. And, and I don't have to, to live um, un, under that type of pressure because it, thankfully it's not based on my performance and I try to do the best I can. Yes, I try to live according to his word. But the performance that matters is the performance that's already been accomplished and that's Jesus giving his life and shedding his blood for me and for you on the cross. That's the performance that matters. And see, the enemy wants to keep calling you by your sin instead of your name because if he can call you by your sin he can get your mind stuck in that old mindset doubting it's an avenue to deception doubt is an avenue to to um, deception uh, confusion am i really saved was i ever really saved am i saved right now all those things are avenues to distraction to keep your mind off of who you are in him. So when you begin to live like that, like Ephesians, the first chapter tells us that who we are, that we are chosen, that we are chosen in the beloved, that we really belong right there next to Jesus and, he, and, and he's got us. Well, when you start living like that, you're going to live a better life. You're going to live a, a more peaceful life. And even in the middle of trouble, you're going to realize his nearness. What does the scripture say? He is a very present help in the time of trouble. How many times has trouble come? And even as believers, God help us. What do we say? Where are you, God? Where's God? Where, where are you? Are you even there, God? Hey, we're missing out on his word when we make little comments like that. When we allow our mind to be distracted, there's an enemy that calls that. But, but here's, here's the thing. He wants to distract you from what is 
What, what is is what the Word says. That's what we can depend on. And the Word says that He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Not only is he, He's present, He's very present. So if you believe what His Word says, that He's everywhere, He's everything, He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, for that God, for, for, for that um, power, the power of God, who is all powerful to be very anything. It just blows my mind. Think about it. God who is everything for him to be very anything. I want to grasp onto that. And I, let, I have to let my mind go there because it plainly says that in the time of trouble, he is very present. So it's, it's me that misses him in those times. Why? Because I allow myself to become distracted. And there are so many distractions right now. So many distractions. Believers, we must keep our eyes on Jesus. Even, even the term in the Bible when it talks about believing on Jesus, it's not just talking about a one-time thing. It's talking about believing and continuing to believe. I believe and I continue to believe. And that's, that's where we get the strength from, is the continual, continual, continual. That's how we grow in the Lord. The Bible says this, by continually feasting, by continually feasting on the meat of his word. It's getting past the milk of the word, getting into the meat of the word, and then continually feasting on it. That's what makes us grow. So last week I was talking about this, that... What happens to us when we get saved? That our spirit becomes saved, that our mind is being saved, and that our flesh is not saved. Okay, let me, let me say it again. My spirit is saved. When I got saved, it was settled. It was forever fixed in Jesus that I am saved and my spirit is saved, but my mind is being saved. The scripture that I use for that is that Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My mind is being saved. I have to continually convince myself and persuade myself till I get to the place where I am assured of it, okay? That I understand that he has me and these things that come and, and, and run through my mind and all of these things, I have to take those thoughts captive so that I can stand in the fact that, yes, my spirit is saved. So my spirit is saved. My mind is being saved. My flesh, it's not saved. My flesh still knows how to do everything that is always done, all of the bad things. That this, 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 say, that this flesh that we're in is corruptible. You, you understand the power of that word? Corruptible? I love to cook with a cast iron pan. I love it. I've got a bunch of them. I've got uh, uh, the big skillets. I've got the flat skillets. I've got the small skillets. I've got the large skillets. And i got the big Dutch oven. I love cooking. I love to cook. You could probably, If you saw uh, underneath my neckline, you would understand how much I love uh, to eat and cook and those things. But um, here's the thing. Cast iron, um, you've got to treat it very specially. It has to stay um, seasoned, and it is seasoned through oil, okay? And that oil puts a, a barrier against all of the uh, corruption uh, because it is a very corruptible piece of, uh, of um, cast iron. So the thing about cast iron, if it comes into contact with water and oxygen, oxidation takes place and rust sets in, and you can corrupt... A, um, a cast iron pan. Well, we are the same way. We are corruptible. And the Bible says this, that one day we will put off uh, the corruptible with the incorruptible. That's my body. This mortal shall put on immortality. I haven't reached it yet. Um, the thing is, my, 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 my spirit is willing. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you better realize that about your flesh. Your flesh is weak. Uh, now, I was raised up with, with wonderful intentions by some wonderful people, but I had to learn some things. And I've said that I'm going to show you some of the things that, that really helped me. Um, one of the things that, that really helped me is that I realized I can talk about my flesh. I can talk about it being weak. 
I don't have to hide that my flesh is weak. Why? Because the Bible didn't hide that my flesh was weak. You need to know it. Your flesh is weak. So out of that knowledge, I don't put myself into some arenas that I used to put myself into. If my flesh is weak, then I am foolish to, to put myself right back into some of those places and some of those instances and some of those situations where my flesh uh, could show out, where my flesh could could um, actually prove just how corruptible it is. Um, here's the thing. Where we are weak, we don't like to talk about that. You know, th this is what happens in churches a lot of times. Um, the, the preacher is preaching on something that we agree with, and it sounds good, and it's a hallelujah moment, and it's an amen, and we'll shout him down. Hallelujah. Preach, preacher. You know, we'll get the hanky out and start waving it. Hallelujah. But let the preacher touch on one of our flesh spots. Let the preacher touch on an area of weakness. And all of a sudden we'll get quiet and sheepish and, and we'll start searching uh, for our pocket for a piece of gum or pop a Tic Tac or something like that or something that look, looks like a, a, we don't want anybody to see uh, any sign that we might have any weakness. So we'll start covering up or we'll start paying attention or we'll will even rear back on the preacher and not even want to hear what he's got to say about that because our areas of weakness, we don't want them to be exploited. We don't, want, we don't even want anybody to know. We want to hide it. We want to cover it up. And then when he gets back to preaching on something that we can agree with and that we like, hey, we're right back in the game with him. But this is not a game. This is your life. And God's will is not for us to struggle because we have weaknesses. We are supposed to learn to be empowered in our weakness. His strength is made perfect. How about that? Why would I avoid that? Why would I drop off of that? Why would I shy away from that? I'll tell you why. Because religion. Religion says, I can't show my weakness. Religion would say to you, you can't show your weakness. If you show your weakness, you're showing, you're, you're telling people that you're not saved or you're telling people that you're not as far along as you should be in the Lord. Let me tell you something. This is what religious will, religion will replace this with. And this is a huge trap. Religion will make you think, I can't show you my weakness, so it'll replace it with something. Since I don't want to talk about my weakness, I'll show you my works. Now think about that. That gets into an ugly, nasty game where you know that you're struggling with something, but instead of dealing with that, you'll, you'll push out what you're doing uh, that, that, that everybody can say, oh yeah, yeah, he's saved. Oh, well, if he's doing that, then he must be doing pretty good. Or You, you understand what I'm saying? Religion, religion says this, I can't show you my weakness, so I'll show you my works. You know what religion is? It is conforming to an outer code. Conforming to an outer code. What is an outer code? It's where it, it's everything around you. It, 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 it's it, it's what people see. That's what the outer code is. It's what people see when they look at you. Oh, if he's got this right, he's got that right. He's not doing this and that and the other. Then he must be doing pretty good. And that's not what the relationship is with about the Lord. That's why Christianity is not a religion. Christianity says. What the word says, that I am saved by grace through faith, not of works. <laughs> How about that? Religion wants you to show your works. But relationship with Jesus Christ and what the word says is, it ain't got nothing to do with my works. It's got to do with his works. Now, there are works for me to do that before time they were created for me to do. But if you get the cart before the horse, then you are driven by being good enough, doing the works, being good enough, and hiding behind being good enough. When that whole thing is, is jacked up, that whole line of thinking is messed up. What you've got to understand that when Jesus paid for my sins, when he died for my sins, he forever fixed it. Works are not the thing. Works are a byproduct of my salvation. Now I want to do things for the Lord. It's not that I have to do. I want to do. Why? Because my mind has been transformed. It's, it's not been conformed to the pattern of the world, but it's being transformed. My mind is renewed and I have to do that daily. I have to do that often. But out of that process, I can get to a place where I am assured of my salvation in Christ. 
My spirit is safe. My mind is being saved, but I've got to be very careful about my flesh because my flesh is not saved. Okay, so uh, let me let me move on to something very quickly with this. Um, in Romans chapter 8, um, let me go down to verse 5. And I think I will read, I'll probably read to... Um, Verse 11, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. That, that, that is so wonderful right there. One translation talks about the, the nature, the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature. See, we've all got a nature, okay? We've all got a nature, and we have a spiritual nature and we have a fleshly nature. That's why I said my flesh is not safe. The, 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 here's, the, here's the thing. Uh, when you have a nature, you have desires. Desires produce your conduct. So, so here's what we got. We, have, we, we all have conduct. And uh, when we were kids, we got this thing called a conduct report. You remember that? And... Uh, a lot of times, if I had a good grade, like, you know, I had a, a B or something like that, or an A, or C was getting kind of testy around my house, that one could get you right there. And don't even think about a D. But um, you say C or a B or, or even an A, those were great as far as, um, as, far as just um, your book smarts and things like that. But there was another grade that you got that had to do with your conduct. And my mom and dad would look at that one and they, they would look at my grades. But if my conduct dropped at all, I'm telling you, I had no grace for my conduct. If my conduct dropped at all, my dad get that look, he'd get that eyebrow drop. He'd come up from that conduct and say, what's this about, son? And uh, my mom would be like, well, I just ain't going to tell you what Sister Judy would do, but uh, she could swing. If she had been in the major league, she would have hit him over the fence all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and she stood by. She was ready. I was going to get my rear end tore up if my conduct was off. So what we want to do is fix our conduct. We want to fix our conduct. When we get saved, we want to fix our conduct. But here's what you've got to realize. Your conduct comes from somewhere. Your conduct is the product of something. And we mess up when we just want to fix our conduct. We just want to fix our conduct. And when we don't know how to fix our conduct because we don't realize it came from someplace. My conduct came from, it, all of a sudden, conduct didn't just happen like, da 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 da. Like, I just did something bad. How did that happen? How ridiculous is that? It happened somewhere. It came from someplace. It came from my desires. We've all got desires. Now, if it was a good thing that happened, it came from my spiritual desires. But if it was a bad thing that happened, it came from my fleshly desires. And you've got, you've got to be able to admit that, that. That's your starting place of maturity is taking responsibility for things. That's, that's how I can tell when my, when my children are maturing, when they start taking responsibility for their actions and for their conduct. Because here's the bottom line. Most of my mess, I got myself into. Most of your mess, you got yourself into. And the sooner you can admit that, the closer you are to restoration and getting back on the right track again. And, uh, but so my conduct, how I act, what is my behavior, my conduct, my behavior, how I speak, how I talk, the conversation that I have, the things that come out of me, those come from someplace. They come from my desires. It's real simple. They come from your desires. Where do those desires come from? Because they leave a, they came from someplace too. Those desires come from your nature. Because you've got a spiritual nature and you've got a fleshly nature. And they all are producers. Your nature is a producer. Your nature is going to produce desires. And your desires are a producer. Your desires are going to produce your conduct. Your conduct does, doesn't happen on its own. It comes from your desires that come from your nature. Your nature is a producer. It produces your desires. Your desires, desires are a producer. They produce your conduct. So there it is right there. So how do we fix it? We go back to our nature. What does the word say? For those who live according to the flesh, 
fleshly nature, set their minds, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, set your mind, reset your mind on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, they set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to be carnally or fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It's, it's all leading somewhere. It's either leading to life or it's leading to death. If it's leading to life, it's leading to life and peace. Because the, the fleshly mind, the carnal mind, is hatred against God, enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. That's why you've got to renew it. The mind, it's not subject to the law of God. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. That's where we get in trouble. And that's why we try to cover it up. That's why we try, we try to, to, to fix things in our mind. That, and if we come into agreement with something or give ourselves a pass and stuff, then, then we're just right back there where we started and we're stuck. And we're stuck in a place where God does not want us to be stuck. He's giving you the tools right now to come out of that. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Real quick, I'm going to go real quick to Colossians chapter 2. In him, remember what we talked about in him. In him I live and move and have my being. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Not what you did, what he did. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So you know what? That's why when we get saved, it, it is a good thing for us to get saved and to get baptized. And it is God's will for us to do that because it is a representation that my old man died and that in baptism I am representing that the old man is dead. That means I don't live according to the old flesh anymore. I don't live according to those that sinful nature anymore because it's got desires that are sinful and it produces conduct that is sinful. I don't do that. I am baptized with Christ. I am dead to that old life. Yes, there's going to be times I'm not perfected. Yes, I still, that's why I said, that's my whole point. When I got saved, my spirit got saved, but the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what the Bible says. My mind is being saved by the renewing of it, and my flesh is not saved. So my flesh still wants to do everything, or it still is possible for my flesh to do everything it used to do before I got saved, but I have to mortify those deeds. Those, those are not uh, to be a part of my life anymore. And so by baptism, I'm simply reading the script. My baptism says this, I died according to my flesh. I died like Christ died. And the life that I now live, I am raised up to a victorious life in Jesus Christ because of what he did. Isn't that good news? So now I'm able to live a life in the Spirit. I'm able to be led by the Spirit. I'm able to be guided by the Spirit. I'm able to live and walk by the Spirit of God. My steps can be ordered by the Lord. Why? Because my spirit man is saved. And that my mind, and the, my mind is now a spiritually centered mind. So then my desires are going to be spiritual desires. And my conduct is going to represent that of the Spirit. It's, 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 it's such a simple thing, but it's just the, the, these, these little things that, that we have to, to make sure. that, And then we have to keep it. 
The Bible describes our, our, our lives like a field, our hearts like a field, and I've got to tend that thing. I've got to keep weeds out of it. I, I, I've got to keep the, the bad seed out of my heart because those things will, will, will just manifest themselves. What, what seed goes in, that's what you're going to get out. So I need it to be good seeds. So when it, when it comes to, to my mind, and I have a spiritual nature and a fleshly nature, I said this last week, which one wins? Very simple, the one that you feed. The one that you feed. If I feed my spiritual nature, it, I mean, I'm gonna grow in the Lord. But if I feed my flesh and fleshly nature, I'm, I'm gonna grow away from the Lord. I'm gonna grow, it's gonna be growing away from the Lord. This is what you, you've gotta understand. While you're feeding your spirit, understand this, you are starving your flesh. And that's why you cannot placate to your flesh. You can't take any tasty morsels of the flesh. You can't do anything like that because your flesh is starving and it will eat and eat and eat. And it still won't be satisfied because it was starving. So make sure that you are feeding your spirit constantly, feeding your spirit. You're a child of God. He's your father. Your identity is in him. It's like I said earlier, Satan knows your name, but he'll call you by your sin, even your past sin. But understand this, God knows your sin, but calls you by your name. Next week, we're gonna get more into your identity in Christ. It is so, so very important. It, it is so very important to know who you are in Christ because who you, if you know who you are in Christ, you can walk in that. You can walk in that. And he set it up where you can walk in that. Hey, I love you guys. And I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to speak into your lives. And um, you know what? We do this every Sunday at Christ Fellowship in Fort Mill, South Carolina on Highway 21. Come be a part if you can. And uh, you can call. Uh, you can get on our church website, christfellowshipcc.org and find out... Um, you can make a contact there. We've got people that will pray for you. We've got a, a Bible study tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. My mother-in-law is going to lead it. It's going to be wonderful. Hope you guys can make it to that. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I look forward to talking to you uh, next Wednesday night. Love you guys.